everybody to Virtual Trivia Tuesdays, brought to you by the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, which is located in beautiful downtown Raleigh, but right now, beautiful downtown Raleigh isn't exactly open for business, so we're bringing you the museum in all of its glory and all the great stuff that we do right here on the museum's internet. That's right, everybody. Welcome to the show. My name is Chris. I am your quiz master for this evening. I have prepared three rounds of science trivia questions just for you. And I don't know about tonight, y'all. I got really inspired, which might mean that the questions are a little bit tough. I was going through them and I feel like I'd get three out of 15 right? No, I'm kidding. It's not going to be that bad. I'm glad that you're here to play with us. We're going to have some fun. We're going to learn some new stuff. I hope that you brought your thinking caps ready for some virtual science trivia. Don't worry, Nathan Pellman. I am going to lay some science on y'all tonight. I hope that you're ready. I'm here to party. I have snacks. I'm set. Do you have snacks? Do y'all get snacks ready when you play virtual trivia? I'm just curious. Things that I think about when I get ready to do these shows. Anyway, here's how we play Virtual Trivia Tuesday. I'm gonna walk you through it, okay? That way everybody's on the same page. Uh, the first thing are the rules for tonight. Now, rule number one is, of course, don't cheat, okay? Don't, don't cheat. You can use your smart friends, your smart family, uh, your smart quarantine buddies, but not your smart phones okay i know that you've got the internet right there at your fingertips right now i'm coming at you with information from the internet but don't go googling the answers uh one because all of the questions have a time limit on them you'll have less than 60 seconds to answer each question and you might not be able to google the answers to some of these in that amount of time and then you know key your answer in so use your brain not the internet's brain cool uh, question number two, uh, rule number two is that I write the questions, which means that I wrote the answers, which means that whatever I say the answer is for tonight, for this show, is going to have to be the right answer. Uh, if I'm like really wrong, and that's been known to happen from time to time, uh, you know, send me an email, let me know about it, and maybe I'll fix it next week, or maybe we'll just see what happens with that. Oh yeah, I see you folks in the chat. Ooh, Holly's got nachos. Okay, all right, I'm with some nachos. Sorry, I got distracted by the nachos. Okay, now the way that we play virtual trivia is that you will want to have two devices or two browser windows open. One of those devices or windows, you'll wanna have this YouTube video pulled up so that you can see or, and or hear the questions as they come. On your second browser window or second device, you'll want to pull up Kahoot.it. That is the web address where we'll be playing tonight's game. That is where you will key in your answers. Don't worry. As a science, Jess is jumping in and helping me out. Thanks so much, Jess, for reminding me. Uh, yeah, since I'm not doing this from the museum and because everything I say and that happens here on my machine has to travel through a wire, then through the air, and then through some more wires, and then probably through the air again to get to you. There's like a nine or 10 second delay on what you'll see happening on the kahoot.it site, that second tab or device where you'll be keying in your answers tonight and what you'll be seeing hearing on the YouTube. All that means that it's gonna pull like nine seconds off of your answer time. So if you're waiting for that last nine seconds, to key in your answer, you might not get it. So, uh, you know, be ready, be aware. Now, uh, let, me, let me see if I can walk you through this real quick. Take a look. So, kahoot.it, K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T dot I-T. That's where you're gonna head on your second browser window. And I have not given the game pin yet, don't worry, it's coming. This is the screen that you're gonna see. It's gonna ask you for code. You're gonna get that code in just a moment. When you key it in and hit enter, you're gonna see this screen where you will click spin and then where it says crazy tiger, that's gonna whirl and then you'll get a unique nickname to play with for our game. For example, I got Agile Llama here. Now you can spin again if you don't like it or you can click okay go. I say just click okay go, let's rock with the show. 
Then you'll see this screen. This is when you know you're in the game. You're ready to go. Let's play. Now, with each question, you will see answer choices like this on the Kahoot.it site. Red, blue, yellow, green, triangle, diamond, circle, square. These colors and shapes will correspond to the answers that you will see over here on YouTube. The text of the answers will be on YouTube. You will key in your answer here on the Kahoot, tapping one of these shape color buttons, all right? If you get the right answer, you'll see a screen that looks a little something like this. And ta-da, great job. Cool thing about Kahoot now is that uh, the faster you answer, the more points you can score. Most of the questions are out of 1,000 points. The faster you get the correct answer, the more of that 1,000 points you can get. Get it wrong, you don't get any points. And that's how we play the game. So, that's all that I can think of that I needed to tell you right now. So I think we should get ready to play Virtual Trivia Tuesday. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's get set here, everybody, is the game pin that you're going to play with tonight. It is 7-9-1-7-5-7. Go ahead and put that into your kahoot.it site. 7-9-1-7-5-7. Wow, it looks like we have more than 103 people tuned into the video right now which means we definitely have more than 100 people playing this game tonight. That is amazing. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Oh, yeah, players are rolling in right now. Smart Oryx, thanks for joining us. Thanks for being with us. Proud Owl, shout out. Welcome to the game. Dynamic Lizard, glad you could be here. As always, thanks for joining us. Hundred eighteen players joining us for Virtual Trivia Tuesday tonight. We're gonna have a fun time. Hundred and twenty-two people. We're setting a record. This Virtual Trivia Tuesday, Science Jess, keep me honest. This might be the most people that have played Virtual Trivia Tuesday so far. I hope y'all are enjoying it. Has anybody played every Tuesday since we started first Tuesday in April? If you have, you know all kinds of great science trivia. Julie, your first time playing. Hey, thanks for being here. Check out all these names. Isn't this cool? Kahoot's such a great, great little tool here. Space B, welcome. Funny Koala, I see you. Bronze Possum, mm-hmm, nice one. Good choice on that one. Classy Panther, welcome to the show. We're gonna get started here. Just a moment, everybody. Oh, the Bairds are in the house. Bonnie and Courtney, yeah, I remember y'all. I've seen y'all here before. Steph, Rachel, thanks for joining us for trivia tonight. All right, well, it looks like we've got just about everybody in the show. Looks like we've got most folks. Don't worry, everybody, uh, if you're having trouble or still trying to figure out your devices, the game pin is over there in the chat. You can jump back into the game if you lose it, and the game pin will remain on screen as we go so that, uh, you know, you can keep jumping in. All right. You ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, we're going to get started right now. It's May 5th, Virtual Trivia Tuesday coming at you. Now, for the first round, we're going to talk about the lesser-loved creatures of the animal kingdom, perhaps, the invertebrates. 
the invertebrates. First question, Trivia Tuesday, here we go. What bee-killing insect with a powerful sting was recently spotted in the U.S. for the first time? Was it the murder hornet? Is it a yellow jacket? Is it the bald-faced hornet? Or is it the mud dauber? Which of these is a bee-killing insect that was recently spotted in the U.S. for the first time? Now, I have a feeling that as fast as those answers came in, everybody has seen this story. It's been all over the place in the last several days. Yeah, it was the murder hornet, also known as the Asian giant hornet. And uh, this, in fact, is a photo of one right here. They're the size of your thumb, and they have a sting that is said to feel like someone pouring hot lava onto your skin. That sounds fun. Yeah, and they're known to uh, be able to take out entire bee colonies. That's, that's wild. So people are kind of worried about this one because they could do some real damage to some of our uh, pollinators around here. Okay, 118 people got it right now. Here's the cool thing. Everybody's scores will get tallied up. Here is your top five. Looks like a space hamster was quickest on the button with 984 points. Welcome to the top spot. Great job, everybody game make sense for you? I hope so, because we are going to rock and roll right into question number two. Question two. What is the name of this 300 million year old creature, which recent research now says was actually a vertebrate? Is it the hammer monster? The tully monster? The Wazowski monster or the Randall monster? What is the name of this 300 million year old creature? Extinct now, of course, not alive anymore. But recent research has determined that it was in fact a vertebrate. few seconds left. It's hard to believe that this creature is a real thing. All right, the answers are in. Now, maybe you've heard about this creature before. It's a pretty wild looking thing. Hard to imagine that this creature even exists like how is it not just like eight different creatures fossilized together into one but the correct answer is it's called the tully monster and yes new research looking very deep at these fossils looking at the cellular structure looking for chitin actually material called chitin in the fossils uh, determined that it was more likely a vertebrate okay how did we do a lot of people got this one right 66 people let's take a look at our leaderboard Big shake up there, big shake up. Of course, we're only two, two questions in, but Dazzled Gazelle has moved into the top spot, 2,823 points. That question was worth quite a lot of points, wasn't it? Let's keep going, though. Bonnie already learned something new, learned about the Tully monsters. That's a good one. Oh, and hey, check this out. Classy Wildcat got the shout out. Up 83 places. Woohoo! Okay, next question. When did true spiders first evolve? Did the spiders first show up 380 million years ago? 45 million years ago? 300 million years ago? Or 500,000? years ago. When did true spiders, true spiders, 
first show up. Few seconds left. Get those answers in. Five seconds. All right. Now, 380 million years ago, an eight legged creature that could spin silk showed up in the fossil record but it didn't have spinnerets to help it spin the silk. It didn't have the spinnerets. So the distinction of true spider goes to 300 million years ago. 300 million years of spiders hanging out on Earth. 50 people got this question right. Let's see if we had any shakeups in our leaderboard. Well, 27 players have gotten the first three questions correct in Classy Pantha has taken the lead, followed very closely by Prairie Goose, Mountain Jaguar, Awesome Llama, and Woody Wombat. Excellent, excellent job, everybody. You ready for the next question in our round one invertebrates category? I hope so. Here it comes. Next question. What is the official state insect of North Carolina? Is it the Carolina mantis? the Carolina locust, the European honeybee, or the Carolina pine sawyer beetle. Which of these is the official state insect of North Carolina? few seconds left. I saw that a lot of you folks playing are living in North Carolina. Hope y'all know this one. There's a few people in this game that absolutely should know this one. All right. Let's take a look at the correct answer. Oh, this question threw some people for a loop now, didn't it? Yeah, now the Carolina Mantis, Carolina Locust, and the Carolina Pine Sawyer Beetle, those are all actual insects, all actual creatures with Carolina in the name. But the official state insect of North Carolina is the European honeybee. That's exactly right. Turns out those little guys are pretty important to the state of North Carolina, given all of the agriculture. And uh, those bee colonies do a whole lot of good work for us pollinating. Now, of course, North Carolina is also home to something like more than 500 native bee species, too. So while the honeybees are our official state insect, let's maybe throw some love every now and then to some of our native bees. Plant, you know, some brown-eyed Susan or some coneflower at, uh, out there in your yard or on your porch. Those native plants go a long way to helping our native pollinators as well. Okay, great job, everybody. Here's your leaderboard. Ooh, yeah, that one shook things up a little bit. Prairie Goose at the top now, Mountain Jaguar, Witty Wombat, Smart Oryx, and Golden Chicken. I believe you are up into the top five now. Excellent job. Ooh, the Wombat. We've got a Wombat husband. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm glad y'all are having fun. Okay, there's your leaderboard. Next question? Next question. Yeah, let's do the next question. That's right, Stephanie. Our state insect is the European honeybee. Which state does not have the trilobite as the state fossil? Which state does not have the trilobite as the state fossil? Is it North Carolina, Ohio, Wisconsin, or Pennsylvania? One of these states does not have trilobites as the state fossils.
few seconds left. Think you know this one? Looks like everybody answered pretty quick on this one. Just a few seconds left though, in case there are any stragglers. Pick a state, any state, take a guess. What do you think it is? Jessica Baird says, they're surprised about there even being a state fossil. North Carolina does in fact have a state fossil, but it is not the trilobite. The trilobite is not it. North Carolina state fossil are actually megalodon teak. Yeah, the largest prehistoric shark. Yeah, uh, you can actually find megalodon teak all over the coast of North Carolina and the eastern part of the state. Uh, really cool and they're huge. You know, it takes like two hands to hold a megalodon tooth from a shark that was like 50 feet long. That's huge. But Ohio, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania all have the trilobite as their state fossils. Let's see how this one shook up our leaderboard. Mountain Jaguar moved to the top spot. Welcome, though, yellow macaw glowing impala and Perry Goose, you held it out, held it out. But hey, check it out. Brave Bobcat got the shout out for this one as the highest climber up 29 places after that question. Fantastic work. Hope you're having fun. It's time for our next round. Round two. Now, round two, I'm calling the shakeups round. So with this round, your next set of questions are gonna be uh, shakeups in the world of science, discoveries that changed our understanding, uh, or maybe just some cool news that's kind of given us new things to think about when it comes to our understanding of the natural world. Here's your first question in round two. Now this shakeup <laughs> shook a lot of things up. Which mass extinction event resulted in the most species lost? This would have been quite the shakeup, right? Was it the Devonian extinction event 375 million years ago? The Cretaceous 66 million years ago? The Ordovician at 444 million years ago? Or the Permian? at 251 million years ago. Which mass extinction event resulted in the most species lost? Well, these events all took out enormous percentages of life on Earth, but the one that takes the cake, the one that tops them all is the end Permian extinction event. That's right. Now, to date, scientists say that there have been five mass extinction events uh, and that we could be right at the beginning of a sixth one. Uh, the sixth one is the scary one because they say that's the one caused by humans. But the Permian event 251 million years ago is thought to taken out something like 95% of all life on Earth. This extinction event nearly ended everything all at once. Uh, the Permian event was thought to have been caused by uh, volcanic activity, a huge surge in volcanic activity, which of course led to tremendous amounts of carbon dioxide gas in the atmosphere, which caused dramatic climate change, but all these lava outflows also led to uh, coal burning off very, very rapidly. So all of this coal burning off then let out more carbon dioxide and more methane uh, and runaway greenhouse planet and only a little bit of life on earth made it through. 95%. Yeah, pretty wild stuff. So, with, you know, extinction in mind, let's take a look at our leaderboard. All right, here's how things changed up a little bit. Classy Panther, Indie Lated Duck, welcome to the top five. Thanks for joining us. 
We're going to rock and roll. Here comes your next question. Get ready. What makes a mega tsunami different from a tsunami? Is it how far the tsunami or mega tsunami travels? Is it that a mega tsunami has a bigger wave? Is it that a mega tsunami forms differently from a tsunami? Or is it that the mega tsunami is caused by volcanoes specifically? What makes a mega tsunami different from a tsunami? everybody here's the correct answer now these two things are a little bit different there is an important distinction between them it's not how big the wave gets it's not how far the wave travels and it's not specifically that it's caused by volcanoes but mega tsunamis are different in the way that they form uh, which probably bears some explanation right probably wondering, well, I don't know. 25 of you may know this one since you got the correct answer, but uh, a mega tsunami is normally triggered by basically an enormous landslide. Tsunamis tend to be triggered by earthquakes on or near the ocean floor. That triggers the waves, and then the waves grow bigger as they approach the shore. So sort of as they move up the coastlines, they move up too. But mega tsunamis tend to be really discrete things. You get a massive landslide, all of the earth drops into the water, and that creates an enormous wave that then hits land, normally not too far away. Um, some of these in recent memory, uh, just a few years ago, it was, uh, there was a hundred, something like a hundred meter wave that landed in Greenland, for example. All right, let's take a look at our leaderboard. There you have it. Smart Oryx has moved into second place. Great job, everybody. Here comes your next question. Brian, I misspelled something. My apologies. Whoa, this question worth double the points. We got a random two-pointer. Here you go. Sinosauropteryx Sinosaurop was the first fossil of a definitively non-avian dinosaur with what feature? Was it hollow bones, feathers, a wishbone, or bird hips? What do you think this one is? Sinosauropteryx was the first fossil of a definitively non-avian dinosaur with what feature? Sinosauropteryx was the first fossil of a definitively non-avian dinosaur with feathers. With feathers. 49 people got this one correct. Excellent job. Now, of course, research had shown that dinosaurs probably did have feathers, uh, that they were, you know, uh, related to modern-day birds as well, but Sinosauropteryx was the first one that definitely showed feathers. 
Okay, real quick, we'll take a look at our leaderboard. Golden Chicken and Adorable Sable moving into our top two spots. Mountain Jaguar, though, hanging out in the top five, as well as Glowing Impala and Classy Wildcat. But hey, looks like Nimble Hawk gets the shout out up 36 places. Excellent job, everybody. Here comes your next question. What is the basic unit of information in a quantum computer called? Is it a qubit, a bit, a soul bit, or a rabbit? What is the basic unit of information in a quantum computer called? Half the time remaining. Hope you've got your answers in. The basic unit of information in a quantum computer, computing power that could transform computing, could change the way that you get your Google map directions, is called a qubit. A qubit, exactly right. Lots of people got this one correct. The Q part maybe gave it away. I hope you could guess that one. Uh, to the one person who said rabbit, thank you very much. I'm much more comfortable in the world of nature and wildlife than I am in the world of computers, especially quantum computers. It's called a qubit. Let's take a look at our leaderboard, see if anything shook up there. Ooh, our bottom three moved around a little bit. Prairie Goose, welcome. Hey there, and six players are on an answer streak three. Next question, folks, here it comes. Ooh, random double points question worth 2,000. Paleontologists recently announced that this dinosaur had a paddle for a tail. This shook up the world of paleontology recently. Did you see this story? Do you know the answer to this one? Paddle for a tail. I brought a photo of this one to show you too. Paleontologists recently announced that this dinosaur had a paddle for a tail. That dinosaur is now thought to have been much more aquatic than previously thought. 35 people got it right. The correct answer is Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus. Check this out. Here's your leaderboard real quick. Golden Chicken with over 10,000 points followed closely by Smart Oryx. Nice work, everybody had lots of people move up in their places this time. But here is the new understanding for Spinosaurus. If you're a dinosaur lover, you've probably seen this. But take a look at the tail. All of those long spines on the top of the tail now tell paleontologists that this guy probably had this huge flat tail that it could use to propel itself as it swam through the water looking for food. Cool stuff. Before, illustrations and the idea for Spinosaurus was that the tail tapered. Think of your, like, typical dinosaur tail. It comes to that little skinny point, not this big, fat swimming paddle like we see or like we know it had today. All right. It's time for round three, everybody. Now, round three, a little bit different. 
For our final round of the game, we're going to go back into the history books for this one. So, hope that you enjoy your science and your history. Two thumbs up. Here we go. Here's your first question in round three. What instrument did Albert Einstein play? Yeah, you weren't expecting that one in your science trivia, were you? Did he play the flute, the violin, the clarinet, or the theremin? Few seconds left. Do you know this one? Do you think that you know this one? Time's up. Oh yeah, people knew this one. Excellent job, excellent job. What instrument did Einstein play? The flute that was playing the violin for you though. Uh, and I wouldn't try one myself, so here we go. Here's your leaderboard. Take a look. We get any shakeups? Proud turtle, classy panther, adorable sable. Hanging out in our top five now. Little green arrows tell me that you moved up. Good, good job. Let's see. Gene wants to know what was the name of his violin. Oh, Gene, you know I didn't get that far in the Wikipedia page. I found me a cool trivia fact and stopped right there. Here we go. Here's your next question. Oh, another other point question, worth 2,000. The point at which all solid materials glow red hot is called what? The point at which all or almost all, maybe it's almost all, we'll go with all solid materials glow red is called what? Einstein did have a name for his violin. Lena? Lena? Courtney says he should have played the viola. Courtney, do you play the viola? Viola? All right. The point at which all solid materials glow red is called the draper point. That's right. It's called the draper point. On this day in 1811, John Draper was born, a scientist who in 1837 or so, I think it was 1837, found that 977 degrees Fahrenheit was the point at which nearly all solid materials would glow red. Draper point, only 31 people got this one right. Let's see how this one shook up our leaderboard. Oh yeah, big changes. Smart Oryx takes the first place spot with 12,333, and Proud Owl moves into the bronze medal spot with 11,072. Green arrows for both of you. Nice job, everybody. Moving on up. Three in a row, though. Epic Eagle, shout out. You're back in the game. Keep up the good work. Here is your next question. On this day in 1961, who became the first American in space. Was it John Glenn, Neil Armstrong, Alan Shepard Jr., or Yuri Gagarin?
Looks like there's still a few answers rolling in. If you're a space nerd, that picture is a hint. Last few seconds. Of course, it looks like most everybody's voted, so I probably waited too late to tell you that was a hint. <sighs> Oops. All right. On this day, May 5th, 1961, who was the first American in space? It wasn't John Glenn. John Glenn was the first American to orbit Earth. Neil Armstrong was the first American to walk on the moon. Yuri Gagarin was the first person in space, but he wasn't an American. He was in the Soviet Union. Alan Shepard Jr. is your correct answer. He spent a grand total of 15 minutes in space on that first trip up. Part of the Mercury missions, that was a picture of Mercury back there, uh, on what they called Freedom 7. Freedom 7. Okay. Here's your leaderboard. Six players just hit it. Answer streak three. Oh, it looks like all of our movement happened below the top five, but top five must be hard to catch. Don't worry, everybody. I might have a little trick up my sleeve coming later in the game. <gasps> Shouldn't have said that. Next question. On this day, what organ was transplanted for the first time in the United States in 1963? Was it a liver, heart, lung, or spleen? On this day in 1963, what organ was transplanted for the first time in the U.S.? Do you know this one? Think you know this one? Feel good about it? Lots of answers come in. Looks like everybody's got their votes in. Time's almost up. So what do you think? The correct answer wasn't the heart. Good guess, everybody. Good guess. Was not a heart transplant. It was a liver transplant. First liver transplant, 1963. Uh, just a few months before that, the same doctor, though, who transplanted this liver had transplanted a spleen. Uh, the gentleman who received this liver transplant survived uh, another 22 days. First liver transplant. Let's take a look at our leaderboard. Any shakeups there? Ooh, yeah. Hey, happy Yeti. Moving into our top five, welcome to third place with 11,384 points. Glad to have you up there in the leaderboard. Purple Elk, oh I see, you got a shout out. Up 18 places, highest climber that question, nice job. Excellent stuff everybody, hope you're having fun. Yeah, folks, I see uh, Science Jess is asking, what science topics are you interested in? Tech, science history, current events, pop culture? You want me to do a whole game of nothing but Jurassic Park trivia? We can do that. Ocean topics. Beeler81 wants ocean topics. You know what? Tune in. We're going to be here every Tuesday in May. Maybe we'll do some ocean. Here's your next question, everybody. Who is this? Based on the third line from their Wikipedia page. Take a look. His best known scientific contribution is research on extraterrestrial life, including experimental demonstration of the production of amino acids from basic chemicals by radiation. That is the third line from this person's Wikipedia page. You tell me who that person is. Is it Nikola Tesla, Carl Sagan, Stephen Hawking, or Kip Thorne?
This question's tricky. His best known scientific contributions is research on extraterrestrial life. Who is this? Now this question, I thought would be tough, but it looks like most folks got this one right. The 65 people got the correct answer that it was, in fact, Carl Sagan. Yeah, Carl Sagan's best known scientific contribution, research on extraterrestrial life, production of amino acids. Not exactly what most folks remember Carl Sagan for, but great job. Let's take a look at our leaderboard. Golden Chicken advances into first place. Excellent job, but five players have gotten the last three questions right. Good, good, good. Here we go. Hold on, everybody. It's everybody to go for gold. You get this one right, you could take the game. Hey, if you were sitting there in our top five, this question is going to be worth 1,000 points. But the trick is you have to get the answer exactly right. Any deviation from wrong, there's no margin for error on this one. You don't get any points. This one is not multiple choice. You will be asked to actually key in your answer. You're going to have to do some typing for this one in order to tell me what you think the right answer is. Get this question right, 1,000 points going in your bank. You ready? Are you ready? I hope you're ready. This one, ooh, I'm nervous because this could really shake things up. I've never done a bonus question before. Remember, you got to key in your answer for this one. Here we go. How many feathers does an emperor penguin have? That's right. Type up your answer. How many feathers does an emperor penguin have? Just a few seconds left. Get those answers in. How many feathers does an emperor penguin have? Well, I'm here to tell you that nobody counted them all exactly, but the correct answer to the best estimate that we have is 180,000. 180,000 feathers based on a square centimeter extrapolation that was done, 180,000 feathers on the emperor penguin. Let's see, did anybody get that one right? I don't know. I hope that somebody did because there was a thousand points up for grabs. You know what? That being the last question of the game, I believe that it is time we check on our leaderboard and we see who takes home tonight's golden medal. Who's it gonna be? Here are your winners tonight. Happy Yeti takes bronze, silver goes to Smart Oryx, gold place. First place, gold medal goes. Thank you so much, everybody, for playing Virtual Trivia Tuesday with me tonight. You're a quiz master, Chris. Thanks for being here, everybody. 
Hope that you come back next Tuesday night and play with us one more time. We'll be here at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on YouTube. Make sure that you register so that you can get all the information you need to play Science Virtual Trivia next Tuesday as well. You can find that information at the museum's Facebook page. We're at Natural Sciences on Facebook. Twitter and Instagram, in fact, but head to the Facebook page, find the Facebook event for Virtual Trivia Tuesdays, should be easy to find, and there you can get the link to register like you did for this event. We'll see you next Tuesday. And hey, while you're at it, check out the museum's Facebook page. We have cool stuff happening there. Give us a like, give us a follow on Twitter and Instagram as well. We're at Natural Sciences across all three platforms. Science Jess, I think, is dropping the Facebook event there in the chat, so you can easily get to it. Perfect. Thank you, Science Jess. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Visit naturalsciences.org to see more great science activities, more live events coming your way. For example, this Thursday night will be our Science Cafe. We'll be talking about extreme weapons in the animal kingdom with author Doug Emlin. That ought to be fun. Tune in for that right here on the museum's YouTube channel. But naturalsciences.org, visit the Science at Home page there. You can access tons of videos, do-it-yourself science activities at home, and lots of great resources that we have for you. naturalsciences.org, click on Science at Home. And, oh, one more thing to let everybody know, there's a cool new development at the museum. Our friends group, the Friends of the Museum of Natural Sciences, have just launched their own uh, Facebook page and an Instagram account. Friends NCMNS. Go check them out too. Say hi to them uh, when they've got cool stuff going on, particularly events that pertain to our members. We love our members. Go check them out. Give them a follow too because we want you to stay clued into everything that's going on with us at the Museum of Natural Sciences. Okay, that's all that I've got for tonight. Thanks for playing virtual trivia tonight with me, your host Chris. Thanks to Science Jess. Thanks to everybody at the museum who helps out. Hope you all had fun, learned something cool, and uh, bye, everybody. Take care.